you guys enjoyed those videos and those of you watching on YouTube, I will put the links to those videos in the description and also in the email I send out. Um, I wanted to share a few things about the shoe boxes and a few other things quickly while we have the video running so people who are still at home can get it at the same time. Thank you, Carolyn. Heading back to shoe boxes, though. Um, we, the boxes have arrived, the cardboard ones, so you'll see them. They're back on that table. You're free to take as many as you will fill. Um, there's some that are already folded. There's some that are flat. They're easier to transport and fold them at home. Uh, so those, I think, are going to be really nice. I look, they are uh, definitely bigger than those old boxes up there. Not a lot, but enough that I think it's going to, we're going to find it makes a difference, which is, which is cool. Um, as Marianne shared during prayer request, but just for the people watching at home, uh, that thing with Walmart was amazing. You know, again, she called for a discount on school supplies, and for those of you watching at home, basically the manager told her to come in and walk around and pick what she wants up to $250. So That's awesome. She, yeah, it is. So she and Abigail went, and um, I'll post a picture on the video I took of everything on that back table. But you're welcome to look at that the stuff back there. Um, and just know that that's our start, and that's pretty cool. I, I need to make clear that our what we're doing here as a group packing is supposed to supplement my hope that each of you are still, you know, who feel God leading are still doing your own boxes. These, these items are not for you to take home to put in your boxes. These are for when we do a packing day here as a church. And the day that we have set aside is Sunday, November 15th. And I'm hoping that each of you could set that day aside and we'll probably cut the service a little short and then begin. We're going to need a lot of help and uh, go from there. I would love if someone would be able to help with putting together, coordinating ideas, a way that we can feed people coronavirus conscious, um, so a way that and my vision is not a sit-down feeding, because we're going to be using all our tables and have this floor just lines of tables filled with stations. People go down to pack boxes. But things where people could go and get something to eat, step aside, eat it, um, however, and then we just see how to get these boxes packed, because collection week begins that Monday the 16th. And so... If you have thoughts of ways we can do that safely, um, individually wrapped things or stuff like that, uh, we've got a little time to figure it out, but please get those thoughts to me, Debbie, Marianne, uh, Stan, um, and we'll go from there. Also, with the boxes we bought, there's you'll see these back there, these follow your box things. This is new this year, and what's really neat is if you intend to do where you go online and pay for the postage for your boxes in what they call the follow your box program where you pay the nine dollars online for each box and what will happen is then they will send you an email and tell you what country your box was sent to and that's really neat if that is your intention this now um, in, the, in the past what you would do is you would then they would email you a PDF to print out you print it out cut it out and tape it to your box this is now really cool because what it has is these little QR codes on it or down the light and so you scan that with your phone and then you go and you pay with your phone for however many boxes and then and then this has the label already that you would take off and stick on your box and the QR codes match. And so what happens, I know we worked at the processing center, is every box that had a prepaid or follow your box label, they have a scan gun and they scan it. And then the crate it goes in has a scan code on that as well and they scan that. So now your box is tied to that crate and when that crate is arrives in country, they every shoe box that was in that crate gets an email and that was follow your box and says, your box just went to the Philippines or in some pretty interesting cases you'll get to a what the words I use country cannot be revealed or something like that it's so if they've sent them to a, a place they don't want to draw attention they're sneaking boxes into persecuted countries they, they'll say we can't tell you what country but, um, but anyway so uh, next 
week, well, right after church, Stan and Marianne and Debbie and I are going to be meeting, looking through what was got at Walmart, what's in the barrel, and we're going to come up with what we still need. And then we are going to place an order this week, probably through Oriental Express or possibly Amazon. And then we're going to also have about $200, $250 potentially next Sunday or for you uh, watching on this on YouTube if you want to contact me this week. And we're going to have lists and we're going to say, okay, we need you to take $50 in the next two weeks, go to dollar stores or whatever. We need as many plastic cups or we need as many wow toys for boys or we need whatever. So that's what we're going to do next um, next Sunday we'll have those. If you're watching this, contact me if you're willing to be one of those shoppers. So that's our plan for that. And I want to I want to re stress again that the money that we are spending, the 500 we have set aside, which now we have 250 from Walmart on top of that. So that's pretty awesome. Now 500 is money that was returned to this fellowship from Gospel for Asia from that settlement when there was some potentially things that did not go right. And they reached a settlement and a percentage of donations were returned to donors. And so this is money that we have already in our hearts sent to the mission field. And so we were just seeing how do we use it. And we felt like God said put 500 into shoe boxes. And so this is not coming out of our general fund. What, what will be coming out of the general fund is the $150 that we paid for the 200 cardboard boxes plus the postage to get them here. So that's coming out of that and probably money to help towards postage will come out of that. So I wanted to make sure you guys sort of knew how that money was being used, uh, how it was being spent. I think, I think that pretty much covers it. Again, if you are packing your own boxes and you have leftover items, um, or you're at the dollar store and want to grab a few extra items for our group packing day, that barrel is back there. You can just keep putting stuff in that barrel. It's over half full right now, which is exciting. So um, please keep that in mind. And if you are like, I can't afford to pack a full box, but I can spend $5 at the dollar store, you know, and get hair clips or whatever, um, they can go in that barrel too. What I do need to know today and for those of you watching on the video, if you could just let me know as soon as possible. If anyone is intending still to talk to their dentist about getting donations of new toothbrushes. I know Dell brought in a bag of them that Colleen got. Uh, someone else told me they have a bunch of home that their dentist had given them. And um, I just need to know because that's something we feel pretty strongly about putting in these boxes. So we need to kind of get a sense of how many toothbrushes we're going to be buying. So that's something if you could let, give me feedback on, I would appreciate that. So that wraps up Operation Christmas Child. I do want to mention the prayer, uh, praying through the directory, every, the name of every regular attendee here over the course of a week. We have all the slots through the end of January filled except for two January slots. If that's something you think you could do or for those watching you think you could do, please let me know and I can uh, fill you in for one of those two January slots. And basically, you'll have from Sunday to Saturday night to pray through every person by name in this fellowship who's coming here regularly. And the other thing is we still have a lot of streets in the Lockwood, Bryson, Hunter Liggett. Well, we got Liggett sort of covered, but Pallone out towards Argyle, Hidden Views, the Plato area that are not covered yet. I think we have 11 different people, individuals or groups of individuals that have signed up to drive or walk through a region, a street or area, praying for each house, each the people in those homes, asking God to prepare their hearts if they don't know him, to bring people to their lives, um, asking God to bless and give them a love for him and for his words that they do know, to protect them. Um, asking God for insight, spiritual insight. If there are strongholds or things in that area that we need to come against more specifically in prayer, uh, history, things like that, that is at work in an area. Um, asking if you're comfortable with it for divine appointments, that you might see someone in the yard, you just stop and talk to them for a while and 
see what God does with that relationship. So I have a lot, I'm very excited by how many streets we have in our area uh, covered already, but we have a lot more. So if that's something that you're comfortable doing, I have the map, I can show you what is and isn't covered already. If you're at home watching this and you'd be willing to do this, please let me know and we'll get you signed up. So I think that is it for the announcements. I want to continue with where we were last week. And under the umbrella of teaching on the believer's authority, the believer's position in Christ, our identity in Christ, and who we are, that we understand that as we begin to push into enemy territory, as we begin to take a stronger stand, um, as, as October settles in, where we know that just spiritual darkness increases this month tremendously across this nation, um, we need to understand who we are. We need to understand our authority as we stand against darkness, our authority, who we are in Christ as we stand against temptations in our life, feelings of hopelessness, helplessness. We need to be reminded who we are. And so I taught two weeks ago through basically how authority was given to man, man gave it away, Jesus got it back, and what the implications are for us as believers. And then last week, I kind of stepped back to give an umbrella, to begin an umbrella look at what we need to understand as believers to really grasp this issue of our identity, our authority in this earth against darkness. Um, in this kingdom, and it's the kingdom of God, or as Matthew says, the kingdom of heaven, they're synonymous. Um, these, this kingdom motif, this kingdom idea, is the lens through which we must be reading the New Testament to understand it. It is um, prefaced, it is foreshadowed, it is hinted through the kingdom of Israel and God's reign over Israel and all of that through the Old Testament. Um, a people in bondage, a rescue, uh, set out, set free, an invitation to be a victorious people, to have tremendous conquering against the enemy. But we see a foreshadow, we see the kingdom motif just explode in the New Testament. And it is, it is truly critical. If you remember the parable of the sower, where I talked about that. And um, in Matthew's version, it says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom. So the word of God, we said, is that thing we want to be letting into our heart. The word of God is the seed that we must let into our heart, and our hearts must be the prepared soil for it to begin to bear fruit. And we talked a lot about what we want to keep out of our heart. This is what we want to let into our heart, is the Word of God. That's where we learn His character, His nature, His promises, His heart. That is where we begin to take our stand. Remember, someone in authority only has authority to enforce what they're given to enforce. Policemen can enforce the laws. They don't make up laws. Um, and we see that. So we need to know God's heart. We need to know his spiritual laws. We need to know what is his will and what isn't his will for us to take a stand in authority against things. We need to know I am doing what God wants me to do. And Matthew, unlike in Mark, Matthew calls not just the word of God, but the word of the kingdom. This word that is wrapped up in this idea of the kingdom of God and this, this motif and then in Mark, he says to his disciples, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? He said, this parable is the key. This parable is the one you've got to get as the key to starting to understand all my other teachings. This word of the kingdom. And we talked about how we are in this clash of two kingdoms. We are in a clash, this battle, we are in, it is something that is so huge and so epic. And as Christians, we've got to understand this because we can feel alone. We can feel like our life doesn't have much purpose. We can feel like we're just kind of bored and just kind of moving through. If we don't realize what we are in, if we don't realize what the stakes are and what we are a part of and what God has called us, you know, I equate it to a, a military unit, and each person in that unit has a different job, a different skill, and the, the continuity and the effectiveness of that unit 
It doesn't care what color anyone's skin is. It doesn't care how old they are or young they are. What it cares about is, are you part of this team? Are you putting your gifts in? Are you contributing? Are we all working? And are we all single-minded towards a mission? And understanding that's what we are as the church a part of. We are part of something that is so big. It is this God at war. It is God that has invaded this place that in the authority teaching we established has been given to the ruler of this world. Jesus calls Satan the ruler of this world three times. And he does not challenge Satan saying, all the kingdoms and power of this world have been given to me. He doesn't challenge him. He just says, I don't want it your way. I'm going to get it through the cross. I'm going to get it back the right way. No shortcuts. But this is what we are a part of. And this is something, if we think about it, is every time you think of kingdom of God, break down that word kingdom. King, no, king's domain. What is it? It is where the king resides, where the king rules, where the king's will is done, where the king is king. You know, as I say over and over, that king can look across the border from Spain to France, I'm obviously talking about older days, but whatever, and he can go, man, I really would like those vineyards. But until he occupies that land and his will is done over it, it's a wish. It's not a kingdom. But when he invades and takes it and his will is now exerted over it, that becomes part of his kingdom. And that is the concept. You know, Jesus would say, we looked at last week, if I cast a demon out of you by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You were ruled by darkness, but now you have a new rule over you. You've been set free of that change. And that's something that we've got to understand and we established last week through many verses that it was the kingdom of God was the message that John the Baptist announced, that Jesus announced, and that Jesus came to preach, Jesus modeled, and we'll see in a few minutes it is also the message that the early church preached uh, in Acts and the epistles conveyed. Um, there, the, the kingdom of God is the gospel message. Okay, we... we we minimize when we say the gospel is simply Jesus came, died on the cross so we could go to heaven and our sins would be forgiven. That is true, and that is incredible. And the cross is the key by which Jesus forgave us and won back the authority that man had given away. I am not diminishing the cross in any way, shape, or form. But I am saying we diminish the cross and we say it's all about heaven. Because there is a present reality to the kingdom of God now, too, that we are supposed to be living and walking in as God's children, his ambassadors, and his soldiers. There is a victory that was won on that cross that we are not plundering. Jesus bound the strong man, and we are not coming behind and plundering his camp and his house. And that is part of the cross. So it doesn't diminish the cross to say it's about more, the gospel is about more than just forgiveness in heaven and eternal life. It diminishes the cross to, re to regulate it, relegate it to that, and not realize the present working of that victory out in our lives and our calling today, the kingdom of God. And it is something that we must understand. Bring Luke 4.43 up, please, Abigail. I read this last week, but Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. What was Jesus? We know he was sent to do the will of the Father. What did he say his purpose was? I was sent to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Now, if, if you take the four words, preach the good news, that is all a translation from one Greek word, which is if you're into the concordance numbers, 2097, but it's euangelizo, which I'm not good at pronouncing that stuff, but basically the core of your evangelism. And the, the meaning of this word is to announce good news, to evangelize, especially the gospel, to declare, to bring, and to show. To bring the good news and to show the good news. It is not simply a matter of words, it is a matter of demonstration as well. And, and Paul's going to say this. The kingdom of God is not in word but in power. He's going to talk about that. And it's something that is part of our life. Some other examples of this exact same word 
In Matthew, Jesus, um, when John the Baptist sent the disciples, his disciple followers there, are you the one? Jesus says, go back, tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised and the poor have good news preached to them. And then in Luke 4, 18 to 19, the, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, if we were to hear that and not have heard what I just said, most of us, I think, would sort of go, well, what's the good news? It's the gospel. It's the message of Christ. It's the message of the king. Well, Jesus has said, I have come to preach the good news of the kingdom. And in Luke 9, 6, you have that, Abigail. We see when he sent the 12 out, they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and hearing everywhere. Preaching the gospel Greek 2097, it's the same word. Early church, Acts 14, 5 to 7. You have that, Abigail, as well. Um, an attempt, this is about Paul and Barnabas. An attempt was made by the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and stone them. They learned of it. They fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of like Caonia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel is the same 2097. It is the same thing. It is to preach the good news, to preach the gospel. The gospel is the message of the kingdom. And this is something that I have found is it, it's important to share. It is important for people to realize that something so big is happening around them. That they are in bondage to darkness. They may think they have have, they're free, but they are slaves to sin and their flesh. They are in bondage because Satan has rule over this world. He owns us. The wage of sin is death. We are dead. We are cut off from God who is life. We are blinded. We are led by lies. And we are slaves to the one who comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But there is a rescue that is possible that we cannot do on our own because we are in chains. But one came into this world, a king came into this world as a lamb. And he came and he lived sinlessly for us and he died. That he would pay that price, that he would purchase us with his blood from the authority of Satan. And it says in Colossians, and transfer us from the domain, there's your kingdom word, of Satan to the rule, the kingdom of Christ. We went from one rule to another. We become, when we put our faith in that atoning death for us, we become adopted as God's children, anointed by his Holy Spirit as his soldiers and ambassadors, and left on this earth to continue to do the work that Jesus did, anointed by this Holy Spirit as Jesus was, led by the Holy Spirit as Jesus was. Acts 10.38, do we not know that Jesus of God appointed anointed Jesus with power and the Holy Spirit, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. The exact same thing God has done for us as his children. And we now become born again into God's army. Our citizenship becomes heaven, not this earth. This is no longer our home. We are now an invading force sent from our home into this world on a mission as soldiers and ambassadors exerting the will of our king fighting this war. And if we don't think we're in a war, read the New Testament again. Put on the armor of God. Resist the devil. You know, be sober, be vigilant, your adversary, the devil. I mean, we do not battle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. I mean, on and on. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but they are spiritual for demolishing strongholds. You know, go on and on, verse after verse. We are in a war. And people need to know that. They need to know that they're going to be born again into an army. Born again into a war. A battle. And that is what we are in until he says, well done, soldier. Come on home. Your, your, your marching days are done. Now you come back to me. Come home. This is not our home. But we are part of something so big and so important. No Christian should feel that there is no purpose in their life no mission for their life, no purpose, no calling. We are part of a battle. And someone bound in a wheelchair that cannot leave their house is no less critical. And in fact, they may be that prayer warrior that is covering people in prayer, the artillery cover under which we are moving 
and, and, doing, and attacking. This is important for us to understand um, because the kingdom of God has a very present component. Yes, the kingdom of God is also about a time when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is coming out to tread out the fury of the Father, and all not covered by the blood will experience the judgment of the Father and be eternally separated into their free choice, which is to do, do it without God. And they'll be eternally bound to their choice and will, which is to be without God. There is a day he's coming back. There is a day he will make things right. There is a day there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. There is a component to the kingdom of God that right now is just a shadow of all we see. But there is also a present day component. We looked last week. Remember when Jesus, they said, how do we pray? And he goes, you pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Add in there now, here, on earth, as it is in heaven. We, we, want to, we, we looked last week at all a bunch of Jesus verses about the kingdom that just get to start to permeate in us that the kingdom was his message. And, and interestingly, if that's not enough, you know, in this short little prayer, your kingdom come, your will. Remember, that's a mark of a kingdom where the king's will is done. Your will be done on earth, as we know it's done perfectly in heaven. And not all, but many manuscripts add at the end of that, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. It doesn't say starting someday, but forever and ever. We are born again as children of a king. And if we're not confident of the present day component of the kingdom of God, we need to go back through the verses I taught last week. Because if we remember John the Baptist and Jesus, they said in reference to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, they said, has come near you. We just saw your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It has come upon you. We saw that the word of the kingdom is the seed that bears present fruit in our life. We saw them say, in the midst of you, over and over there are present day words used about this kingdom. This idea of a king, of a clash of kingdoms, of a war, and it all boils down who has authority, who has dominion, who has rule, whose will is done. And this is a component that we've got to look at. Just because Jesus told Pilate, you know, my kingdom is not of this world or from this world. Those are origin words. Just because it's not birthed in this world does not mean it is not in this world. To the contrary, Jesus said it's in your midst. It has come upon you. It is here. We're just seeing the battle right now. If we're not confident through the simply the, the Gospels, that the message of the kingdom was the critical message Jesus preached. Abigail, please bring up Acts 1-3. The first chapter of Acts, the story of the early church, already by the third verse we see, now let me ask this, if you knew you had 40 days left on this earth, and there were people that you cared deeply about, and you wanted to impart your wisdom to them and make sure they understood the most important things you could leave them with, my guess is you would spend your 40 days focused on that. Then he presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. In Acts 8, you do not have this, Abigail, when Simon um, went into Samaria, he demonstrated the power of God, he was showing the works of God, he testified of Jesus Christ, and it said, when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. What was it Philip was doing? He was preaching good news, gospel, about the kingdom of God and about the name of Jesus Christ. In Acts 19.8, you'll have this, Abigail. We're referencing Ephesus where we know there was mighty spiritual warfare in Ephesus. This is your seven sons of Sceva. This is where they burned all the 
magic books. This is all of this. It was an epic spiritual battle for Paul in Ephesus. He entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly. What was he talking about? Reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. And then in the next chapter, when he calls the elders together just before he leaves and commissions them to take care of the church in Ephesus and says, you're not going to basically see me again. This is what he, he said to them. Behold, I know that none of you among who I have gone about proclaiming, proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. What did Paul say? What, I've gone among you proclaiming the kingdom. And then in a, in a beautiful sandwich, so we see the kingdom of God at the very beginning, three verses, as the, most, the things that Jesus spent his last 40 days with his disciples, the resurrected Jesus teaching them, we see it as the message of the early church, and then we see in the very last chapter of Acts, Acts 28, 23, you'll have that. When they appointed a day for him, Paul, they came to his prison in Rome. They came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And then the very last verse of Acts, about Paul still in prison in Rome. You'll have that one, Abigail, verses 30 and 31. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. Last verse of Act, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. It is a kingdom of God sandwich in the book of Acts. It is the bread and it is the meat. And it's on both sides and it's in the middle. And this is something, and then we roll straight from there, we roll into the epistles. Romans 14, 17, you'll have that. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about, let's not get into, your brother thinks you shouldn't eat that, you think it's okay, don't cause them to stumble. This isn't what the kingdom of God is not about, what food you can and can't eat. The kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God is about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And if you notice, each of those, righteousness, peace, and joy throughout the epistles are all present day experiences that are available to the believer. They are all things that the believer should have in the present, in the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the righteousness we have in our faith, the fruit of the Spirit, it all a present day, not a someday component. It'll be, will it be amazing, our peace and joy in heaven? Yeah, it's going to be incredible. But it's also available to now. Jesus said, I'm teaching these things that your joy may be full. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world leaves it, because it doesn't come from the world. It comes from me. I leave you my peace. These are the things he leaves us now. And it says the kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When God has rule and reign in our heart, we are going to have peace and joy, and we have the righteousness. It comes from knowing who we are in Christ, knowing who is Lord over our life, who has adopted us, who has called us his own, who we serve. And being reminded of that, when the battles come and the world's in chaos, we remember, well, this shouldn't surprise me. I'm in a war. Bombs are going off all around me, but I know who my king is. I know who I serve, and I know where my home is. 1 Corinthians 4, 19 to 21. So these people are talking basically smack in Corinth, and Paul's writing to them and saying, I'm coming, and we're going to put an end to this. He says, I'll come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. And here he goes, so what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod? Or with love and a spirit of gentleness. Are you going to take care of this or am I going to come fix it? But trust me, it ain't about a bunch of hot air. It's about what do you got to show? Because that's what the kingdom's about. So they're talking stuff. You want to know who's really part of the kingdom of God? Then we'll come. Reminds me of Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh's magicians. It's like, let's get down. Let's go. Because the kingdom of God is not just about eloquent talk. It's about a demonstration. Remember the root of that 2097 is not just to proclaim, but to show and to bring the good news of the kingdom of God. And through, um, throughout like Corinthians, we see other references to the kingdom of God. 
When we talked about who will not inherit the kingdom, don't be deceived, neither sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. As such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He talks about that in other places. When Jesus comes, he's going to deliver the kingdom. Um, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom, nor does perishable inherit the imperishable. It's a spiritual kingdom. Um, in Galatians, he talks about if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law, and then the works of the flesh and those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then the one that's probably the greatest verse about it in the entire Bible, Colossians 1, 13 to 14. You have that out again. He has delivered us from the domain, domain, kingdom word. I know I just walked off camera, sorry. Kingdom word, domain, dominion of darkness. Who ruled us? The one Jesus said is the ruler of the world. But what did he do through his work on the cross, his receiving of all authority and our faith in that? He transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. We have a new ruler over our life. And as such, his life comes into us, our presence comes into us, and that's why he says there's no temptation too great that you do not have a way out. You cannot say the devil made me do it. You cannot say I can't say no to that. You cannot say that because you now are not under the rule of the flesh or Satan anymore. You are a child of the king, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, with all of his power and resources at work. It doesn't mean it's not going to be a battle. It doesn't need... The old voices and the old temptations and the old habits are just going to walk away. In some cases, they will. I know people that have been healed of addictions the moment they gave their life to Christ. And I know others who have battled long after that. But the point is, if you know who you are and you know what the kingdom of God means, a new rule over your life, and you know that Jesus came that you might have life abundantly, and it is your old ruler who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy you now can act with more confidence and take a stand. And faith is the assurance of things not yet seen, the confidence of things hoped for. And it's saying, no, I don't have to give in to this. I do not have to give in to this lie, this fear, this doubt, this temptation. I can live a holy life. I can live a pure life. I can kick the devil in the tail. I can do this because I know who my king is. And I know who now has reigned over my life. Amen. That's right. Um, and, uh, yeah. um, real fast, Colossians 4, 10 to 11. You'll have that. Aris, Aris Darkus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Uh, with, uh, Jesus, who is called Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God. They have been a comfort to me. What is Paul saying? What is my work? My work is for the kingdom of God. These people are fellow workers. And I'm, I'm going to skip the last verses, Abigail. I'm going to, I'll come back to that next week. But I want to just summarize with saying a few things. If, you, if you're still not getting, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, this is a whole new way for many of looking at what is the gospel, what is the fullness of the message we are supposed to take to the lost, what is the message John the Baptist proclaimed, Jesus proclaimed, the early church proclaimed, the epistles proclaimed, the message that screams out? It, what are the lenses that through which we need to read to fully understand the gospel and who we are in Christ? It is a kingdom message. This is hard for us. We may not recognize it because we live in a representative democracy and we're not used to kingdom terms. But I did a search, and, and this should be, this was like, wow, for me. So I shared this last week. The word, and everything's from the ESV. The word kingdom or kingdoms, plural, occurs 151 times in the New Testament. The word king occurs 79 times. The word kings, 30 times, for a hundred of, a total of 119. The word throne, 47 times. Thrones, seven times for 54. So kingdom, kings, and thrones occurs 324 times in the New Testament. 
If you throw in the word prince, there's five. Most of them are about, um, well, never mind. Uh, ruler, 22. Rulers, 25. Lord, 603, mainly about Jesus. Lords, 4. Dominion, 9. Domain, 10. Those total 705 occurrences. So if you take king, kingdoms, variations of those, throne, thrones, prince, rulers, lords, and dominion and domain, 1,029 times those words occur in the New Testament, which is maybe about a quarter of the Bible. Is the idea of rule, who we are submitted to in authority, who has authority over us, who rules us, clash of kingdoms, a battle, is this important to understand the New Testament? Yeah. Start to throw in warfare words, armor, war, battle, strongholds, and you just start to go over the top. Anyway, uh, hopefully that will help us to understand. My heart next week will be to wrap up the kingdom portion and tell us, so what? So how does this affect me? How do I walk differently, read my Bible differently, carry myself differently because of this? And then go back into looking now through that lens or umbrella a little closer at the authority we carry as believers in this battle and this war. So I'll pray if you guys want to come on up for the closing song. Thank you, Father, for your love for us. Thank you that you have transferred us from the dominion, the domain, the rule of Satan. You have purchased us with your life blood and transferred us into the kingdom of your Son. I thank you, Father. I thank you so much for your love. Thank you that you are not king over our lives, that this is not our home. I thank you, Father, for your goodness. And I ask you to help us to be aware of who you have called us to be, of the battle we are in, and to carry ourselves appropriately, to not diminish what you did on that cross, but to plunder every of what you purchased, that there would not be one thing or person that you bought with your blood that we do not redeem and claim for your name and your kingdom, Father. I ask you would help us to walk differently, carry ourselves differently, see ourselves and our purpose on earth differently, and I thank you. I thank you for the most incredible love ever shown that you would give your life on a cross. Carry our sin for us. May we live fully, sacrificially for everything you did and nothing would be done in vain. And I thank you for that.